I think there are a couple disadvantages with proof of work. Um, one of them being their energy consumption. So as uh, I studied environmental biology in college and when I was first introduced to Bitcoin, I, I, I read several articles about how much energy it actually takes to process these transactions. So if you're not familiar with um, proof of work mining, basically you can involve yourself today. All you have to do is go on a site called bitmain.com and purchase an ASIC miner. ASIC miner and that's that specialized computer that's going to solve that proof of, proof of work equation and it, you can look them up on YouTube they're very noisy and over time they have to increase their computational power like I was saying before a machine an ASIC miner machine five years ago is not going to do anything today because the computers that are solving them are much quicker much faster, much more powerful. So you need to have the latest and greatest machine to even give yourself a shot of solving that, that, that computational problem. So basically what this has done is increase the amount of electricity or power that Bitcoin needs because Bitcoin is a proof of work system to actually function. And it's gotten incredible over, over the years. And you're going to hear many arguments on many different sides, but before you hear an argument advocating for the electricity use of Bitcoin, you also have to question the person that is telling you that argument for the electricity use of Bitcoin. Meaning that if the person's pockets are extremely deep and they hold a lot of Bitcoin as, as it is, they're just like, oh, you know, electricity use, oh, it's fine. Oh, you know, whatever, whatever rationale they have behind it, they're rich, they're gonna become richer they're less worried about the environmental effects of this cryptocurrency. But at the end of the day, these environmental effects are real. I printed out a couple of statistics just so I can get my facts straight. And right now, the Bitcoin's current estimated annual electricity consumption is 52.88 terawatt hours per year. And Bitcoin's current minimum annual electricity consumption is 45.41 terawatt hours per year. And if you're not familiar with how much energy that is, that is an incredible amount of energy. And it doesn't go down. It goes up year by year by year by year. When Bitcoin was very small, it used a relatively lower amount of electricity to process these transactions. But over time, it has increased dramatically. The country closest to Bitcoin in terms of electricity consumption as of today is the country of Bangladesh. So the entire country of Bangladesh uses the same amount of electricity that Bitcoin uses to process their proof of work transactions. Now you're going to hear some counter arguments within the community saying that, oh, well, you know, they're, we're going to be using, Bitcoin's going to be using a more renewable resource. They're going to be using renewable energy resources in order to mine. So basically, the ASIC miners are going to be running on clean energy, whether that be wind or solar, whatever clean energy is available in that area. But the, the, the fact is, that's furthest from the truth. The largest Bitcoin miners are in China and they're using coal in order to process these transactions. And to think that a decentralized cryptocurrency is not going to be utilizing the dirty forms of energy is just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Although there may be more renewable resource, uh, renewable energy resources coming in the future, these still require energy to make these renewable resources. So you need energy to create solar farms. You need energy to create um, wind turbines, you need energy to create the system. So proof of work is a lot. It's very energy intensive, a waste of energy, in my opinion. Um, I have one more statistic. The number of U.S. households powered for one day for the electricity consumed for a single transaction. So a single transaction. So if I sent Sebastian today 0 0.001 Bitcoin the value, the amount of energy it would take to process that transaction, relatively speaking, is the amount of energy it um, U.S. households produce in one day from 18 households. So 18 households combine their electricity output for one day, and that's that dumb transaction I sent 0 0.001 BTC from myself to Sebastian. That's a waste. So people are going to buy some stupid socks online. And they're using the amount of energy for 18 houses. And I know you may not care about electricity usage. You may live in a first world country. 
you may live in some skyscraper in New York or, um, you know, you may live in San Francisco and you don't care about the rest of the world and you leave your lights on all day and you leave your computer running all day. But that's a real transaction. It affects the world. And I'm sorry, any transaction that takes the electricity usage of 18 U.S. households, and this is the minimum, it's going to increase. It's dumb. People are doing dumb transactions all day, and I just don't think it's useful. So that's one of my gripes for um, proof of work. Sorry that I got so heated. Um, I just think that I, I'm passionate about the electricity usage of proof of work versus proof of stake. And once again, to remind everyone, Cardano is much more sustainable. It's a proof of stake system, not a proof of work. Bitcoin is a proof of work. All right, Sebastian, I, I, you can jump in. Yeah, I mean, this is what I was talking about earlier, where I was saying it's an alternative system, right? It, the proof of work for Bitcoin is beyond just a huge amount of electricity use. It's a huge cost to the network, right? So I was just saying, I think the cost to the network is something around like a million per day. It's in the millions per day. So if you look at the price of Bitcoin, that's like, you know, slowly going down over time. This is the fee you're paying for all these people wasting this electricity to get the Bitcoin, right? So they run these miners and huge farms and then they got to pay the bills. So they sell, sell part of the Bitcoins to pay the bills, right? And the entire network is covering that cost. So if you have a, a more sustainable system, not only do you save electricity, but you save electricity for all the participants of the system, right? So that's one thing I want to, you know, just mention real quick. Uh, but one thing I want to say also is, so what's fundamental, fundamentally the difference uh, between, sorry, uh, proof of work and proof of stake, right? So I was talking about the lottery system earlier, uh, but you have to kind of have a discussion about how we get these tickets, right? The tickets for the lottery. And how is getting these tickets differ between the two systems, right? So as I was saying earlier, the proof of work it's supposed to be like a one CPU equals one ticket. Whereas in proof of stake, it's one coin equals one ticket. But so what's the difference between a coin and a CPU in a sense? Okay, well the thing is that the CPU is a resource you have to burn that lives off the chain. Okay, in proof of stake, the coin is a resource that lives within the system and you don't have to burn it, right? And that difference is what causes all the technological differences between proof of work and proof of stake, right? Because for example, if a proof of stake system gets a rollback, the history like reverts, you do not like uh, lose the, system, the use of the coins. You still have your lottery tickets, right? In the proof of work system, if the history rolls back, you lost that energy, the time to mine forever, right? And this is because it's a resource you have to consume and the consumption happens off chain, right? So you can imagine a system that's kind of a hybrid between the two. And what, I, what I mean is that, okay, let's have a proof of stake coin where when you stake your coins, you're actually burning your coins, okay? So now we're kind of in between proof of work and proof of stake. Okay, you have to burn a resource to get your ticket, but the resource still lives on chain. Well, then what happens is this rollback, right? Then you get your resource back out of nowhere, right? So the fact that your resource lives on the chain actually does make a, dif make a difference, right? So I think I just want to like cover this difference between the two systems fundamentally, because if you're wondering why proof of stake is such a hard mathematical problem and why it's taking us so long to do all the research to get where we are now, it's because proof of work is kind of a simpler system in that sense. You know, you burn some resource that splits off a chain and then somehow you get tickets out of this to participate in the lottery, right? Uh, but proof of stake, because it lives inside the system and you don't lose it, the security argument has to be much more detailed. I'm not sure how to say detailed, but like uh, much more involved. And I would, uh, so hopefully I would that's like a good explanation. To, 
Yes. And I would like to add that that security debate is is very prevalent within the crypto community. Uh, people that are very uh, high proponents of proof of work systems like proof of work protocols like Bitcoin are going to argue that proof of stake protocols are less secure. Um, but at the end of the day, proof of work do have their own security flaws themselves. They are subject to 51 percent attacks. And Bitcoin is basically what that means is the amount of computing power. So let's say all the hashing power, all the ASIC mining power, those specialized computing machines. If one party owns 51 percent of that hashing power or that computing power, they can do things to manipulate the blockchain in their favor. Whether that's whatever they can do, they can create coins out of thin air, roll back systems. They're in control of the network. And that's a real vulnerability of Bitcoin. And I just want to preface this by saying that I am a fan of Bitcoin, but it has its problems. There are better out there. And the only reason why I say this is because I, I mentioned that site bitmain.com to order your ASIC miner, but that is a Chinese company. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there are pools and you know, basically, if you join these pools, you increase your chances of winning or solving that computational problem because all the computing power gets combined and you just increase your chances. So there are these big pools that amalgamate all their ASIC mining machines and a large percentage of them are in China. And I believe it's upwards to almost 50 percent now. So, you know, and I'm not saying anything bad against China, but the Chinese government, if they wanted to, I don't know, take over the Bitcoin network, they could do it. Theoretically, they could do it. I mean, China has certain um, the government could come and take over these farms overnight if they wanted to and take control of the Bitcoin network. I don't know how everyone else feels, but I think that's a real concern within the traditional proof of work for Bitcoin. Yeah, there have been takeovers before, so it's fair enough to have concern about that. Uh, Philippe, what I want to do is I want to touch on some of the, the statistics that you mentioned earlier, like the 56 terawatts or, of uh, power per year that's been used. And uh, what I had done is looked up approximations that's about $300,000 per hour. That's what I was doing while you guys were talking. I was listening. Um but there's information out there saying it's about $300,000 per hour to run the miners. And I did some quick math at 12.5 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, which is the current proof of work for Bitcoin. 12.5 times six to give you one hour times $4,000 per Bitcoin is $300,000. So when Bitcoin drops to 4,000. Uh, last week it dipped below 4,000. When it hits 4,000, there's no, there's really no ROI. I mean, the miners are going to get ROI, but it's going to average out. So that's just a quick math I ran here. Uh, Bitcoin's at $4,200 right now. So you're actually going to make a little bit of money, just a little bit by mining Bitcoin based off of the power and using the ASICs. Uh, so I just kind of want to roll that back into what are the pros and cons of proof of work versus proof of stake. And for the for the average person out there, proof of work has proven secure. Now that that's been proven secure, uh, the migration is towards proof of stake. And what Cardano is trying to do is get proof of stake to have the same properties as proof of work, the same security properties so that proof of stake is just as secure. With proof of stake, your coins, like Sebastian had mentioned, your tokens become the miner because they reside in the network and they provide the security to the network. It's very complex. It's a little bit uh, higher level. That's for a future episode. We'll get into more details on that on a future episode. But for now, the compare and contrast is proof of work is you use a physical computer to secure the network. It burns a lot of energy. Proof of stake, you're using your value as the miner uh, to secure the network. And some of the advantages to proof of work, are not just security, but in a proof of work system, if the token you're mining loses value, you can just repoint your miner to another token that makes more money. Fair enough. Uh, there are some advantages to proof of work. And you can just pick another coin and say, I don't like this one anymore. I want that one instead. 
And with proof of stake, one of the drawbacks is is if you if you don't want to invest in that token anymore, your token serves as the miner, and you want to change up. Basically, when you trade your token, you're selling your miner off. But of course, you're buying into a new one or you're buying into a different coin, so it's not a total loss. Uh, it's more of a loss on the miner because they just over time they're not powerful enough. 